Let us pray. O Lord, Almighty God, grant us ears to hear the truth of your holy word and hearts to receive it earnestly. We thank you for the example of faithful service to Christ, whom you have given us in the saints who have come before us. And we humbly ask that by your Holy Spirit, you sustain us in a lifetime of service to your Son, and so emulate the heroes of our faith. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It's a lovely, steamy morning we have today, but we are thankful again to be gathered together on this, the Bickerstaff's back porch. My sermon today is going to be focused a little different than it has in the last several weeks. Two days ago, on Friday, July 17th, Dr. James Innell, or J.I. Packer, went on to be with the Lord. J.I. Packer was one of the greatest evangelical Anglicans, and he belonged to a towering class of Christian theologians whose positive impact on God's kingdom can never be quantified. Along with John Stott, J.I. Packer had an unmatched apologetic and accessible style that bridged the gap between Western evangelicalism and the churches of the great tradition, clarifying the centrality of justification by faith alone and so unifying both camps of modern-day Orthodox Christian faith. And so it's important for us at times like this to take a moment to reflect on those heroes of the faith who have gone before us and have made possible the worship that we know today. Today, our Bible passages call to mind our hope in the consummation of our redemption through Christ in glory at the last day. The readings remind us that in Christ, we are filled with hope by our redemption from sin and the future redemption of our bodies through the bodily resurrection. Our faith requires us to daily live and ponder these simple truths these simple and eternal truths. And by reflecting on the examples set by the saints whom God has given us, by the Christian heroes whom God has given throughout all of history, we can witness examples of Christ-glorifying lives to which we also can aspire. Indeed, the Common Prayer Book includes a calendar of saints toward the front, saints with a lowercase s, that is, generally organized by heavenly birthday or day of death. And it's for this very purpose that the calendar of saints is placed in there for the sake of having moments throughout the calendar year to be able to reflect upon the example given by the heroes of the faith. But the prayer book, I think, states it best Taken from the preface of the Calendar of Saints, it reads, The Reformed Catholic Anglican tradition teaches that the remembrance of the saints is to be commended for the purpose that the priesthood of believers may follow the blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, in order that we may one day come to those ineffable joys that Almighty God has prepared for those who truly love him. The Anglican tradition, it goes on, has always understood that there is great benefit in remembering the saints whom God has given to his church Catholic, 
since the 16th century Reformation period, Anglican divines have given us three reasons for such honor. First, we thank God for giving faithful servants to his church. Second, through such remembrance, our faith is strengthened as we see the grace and mercy that God has extended to his saints of old. Third, these saints are examples which we may imitate in their faith and their holy living according to our own callings in life. As it stands, the calendar of saints, as a matter of fact, has a provision for Dr. J.I. Packer as a notable Christian who was deemed worthy of inclusion in the calendar upon his heavenly birthday. Having said all this, let's again take a moment to reflect upon the life and service of J.I. Packer to God's kingdom as an example of how we too may live out the truths given to us in Holy Scripture. J.I. Packer was born on July 22nd in 1926 in a county in the southwest of England to a lower middle-class family of nominal Anglican faith. They weren't very heavily practicing Anglicans. They went to church and considered that enough. At the age of seven, Packer endured a severe head injury after a schoolyard bully chased him into the street where he collided with an oncoming bread truck that was driving by. And this caused severe fractural damage to the right front part of his skull, leaving a permanent indentation and which caused him to have to wear a steel plate held in place with an elastic band until the age of 15 in order to have the wound protected. It was a different time back then. A quiet and solitary young man, it was actually the gift of a typewriter that Packer received that perhaps set the trajectory for his life and career to follow. Having first asked for a bicycle, his parents, considering the injury he sustained, thought it best to instead get him a more constructive gift, and so he received an old typewriter. And though first surprised, Packer at once began to almost write immediately, nonstop. Packer would then go on to become one of the most prolific Christian authors and theologians of the 20th and 21st centuries. And here we have an example of God knowing our necessities and giving us gifts for which we are too blind to ask. Packer later came to Christ at an evangelistic sermon in England at the age of 18. And later on in 1944, he discovered the writings of the Puritan John Owen, which shaped Packer's theological work to emulate Puritan spirituality and a focus on communion with God in Christian daily life. J.I. Packer would then go on to live one of the most prolific, yet steady, and humble lives of Christian ministry ever seen in the 20th century. He was ordained a priest in 1953, and he earned his doctorate in 1954. From there, he would go on to write countless essays, magazine articles, letters, books, and forwards to books, while also continuing his academic career in different teaching capacities. Packer's most popular book, Knowing God, was published in 1973, which he described the writing of this book with the conviction that ignorance of God lies at the root of much of the church's weakness today. Sadly, I think those words still ring true, which speaks to the importance and the timeless nature of the works that he contributed to the modern-day Christian canon. Packer moved to Vancouver in Canada in 1979, where he lived the rest of his life worshiping in the Anglican, uh, the Canadian Anglican Church, and he exercised a profound influence on evangelical thought in North America. 
going on to serve as the general editor of the English Standard Version of the Bible in 2001. Many biographers have noticed, interestingly and amazingly, that Packer wrote so much, it's actually impossible to compile a complete and total list of everything he's ever written. It's impossible to actually count all of his writings. He has more Christian works than possibly can be counted, it is said, because he wrote across so many different genres and in so many different forms and styles, including letters and essays and forewords and private publications, as well as reprints of books that he had previously written, that there's no way for biographers and historians to accurately identify them all. Now, recalling our own privilege of emulating heroes of the Christian faith, we would do well and we would be wise to notice Packer's willingness <coughs> to stand on biblical conviction in the face of controversy. In 1966, Packer backed John Stott in the face of calls by Martin Lloyd-Jones for evangelicals in England to effectively secede from doctrinally mixed denominations, which was primarily Anglicanism, to secede from Anglicanism and instead form an association of evangelical churches. But Packer opposed that move, instead supporting the idea of the great tradition and retaining that Anglican identity. He went on to further his defense of that Anglican tradition with a publication in 1970, and in so doing, he risked friendship and association with some of his most famous contemporaries in order to defend the great tradition of the church universal, which we espouse today. In his most <clears throat> polemical decision in 1994, Packer joined the movement Evangelicals and Catholics Together, which emphasized the need for both Catholics and Evangelicals to present a common Christian witness to the modern world. Packer believed that the most serious division amongst the Christian world was not that which divides Protestants and Catholics, but that which divides conservationists, that is, conservative, traditional, orthodox believers, those who wish to preserve the faith from theological liberals, those who seek to diminish any sort of essential truth presented by Christianity. He sought to uphold, in a sense, those great creeds and confessions that we recite every single week. And in yet another show of conviction, and perhaps the most relatable to some of us listening, J.I. Packer's church voted to leave the Anglican Church of Canada in 2008 after the denomination began blessing same-sex unions. So through this, we see, again, a pattern of humble yet bold service to the kingdom of God and a willingness to take bold stands of faith on controversial decisions. But perhaps more impactful than the great stands Packer took for the faith was the humble support he gave to the unrecognized saints for decades and decades, which comprises, I think, a majority of his work that we have today Dr. Packer was well known for endorsing Christian books, often by authors who weren't well known, for the sake of helping lay readers, average people like you and me. Packer gave hundreds of endorsements and forwards in his lifetime, and he was also known for speaking at small conferences and even meeting in people's homes, doing behind the scenes work for movements led by other people for which he rarely received any credit. But this work undoubtedly strengthened evangelicalism as we know it today. And so looking at the life of this towering redwood in Christian history, we learn that the most important work that we do for God's kingdom is work for which we do not get any credit at all. So while learning about the life of Dr. Packer, 
I noticed a common theme emerge from the dizzying list of his ministerial contributions. And that is a, a commitment to the simple truths of the gospel and Christian hope presented plainly and in an unconceited way. For us, this means an example of living in light of our hope in Christ, day in and day out, during not just the turbulent times, but also in the mundane. The truths we are taught this week are plain, just as the gospel is plain, and so is our need for a savior. In the book of wisdom, we are reminded of our hope in redemption from sin. It reads, through such works you have taught your people that the one who is righteous must be kind and you have filled your sons with good hope because you give repentance for sins. And in the gospel of Matthew, in the parable of the weeds and the wheat, Jesus calls to mind not only the final judgment on the last day, but also the glory of God's people in heaven. And toward the end, Jesus says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. But our passage from Romans 8 provides the most thorough description of our hope for redemption. The apostle Paul writes, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it. With patience. What a hope we have in Christ. For not only do we receive forgiveness of sins by grace through faith, but we also await our perfect resurrection bodies to be received on the last day. And imagine how our lives and our ministries would change if we lived each and every day as if we actually recognized this truth not just in our minds, but also in our hearts. Contrary to what Paul writes, we are so focused on what we can see that we spend no time thinking about that which we cannot see, that is the work of God in our lives and the promise of life eternal and fellowship with the triune God in heaven for all eternity. And what of patience? in our Christian lives. Rather, like the prodigal son, we demand our inheritance, we demand our money, it's my money, and I need it now. With respect to our physical bodies, our expectations are much the same. They're in direct conflict with what the Apostle Paul writes to us in Romans 8. We see our bodies deteriorating from age and from disease and from injury. And we are tempted to despair. We're driven to do things that might not otherwise be wise in an attempt to artificially extend our lifetimes. And this is because we forget the promised resurrection and we think that God owes us these perfect, healthy bodies right now on the basis of our own merit because we're good people and we deserve it. So here again, we would do well to look to the example of faith set by Dr. J.I. Packer. Plagued by macular degeneration in his later years to the point of near total vision loss, Packer never lost sight of eternity. He had this to say about aging. How should we view the onset of old age? The common assumption is that it is mainly a process of loss, whereby strength is drained from both mind and body, and the capacity to look forward and move forward in life's various departments is reduced to nothing. But here, the Bible breaks in. 
highlighting the further thought that spiritual ripeness is worth far more than material wealth in any form. And that spiritual ripeness should continue to increase as one gets older. If scripture challenges us to keep in mind our faith and our redemption through Christ Jesus, then the saints whom God has provided give us the blueprint for what that might look like in our own individual lives. Praise God for his servant, J.I. Packer. And may we, by the Holy Spirit, live out our lives in the same humble service to Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.